Hello, everyone. This is Greg, your host of Goddamn GameCube. Welcome to Season 3. If you enjoy listening to our show, consider subscribing to us on YouTube for exclusive video content. Thank you and enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Goddamn GameCube. Greg and Beppy are your hosts today, and today we're going to be talking about Telltale Games and their graphic adventure games, sort of the rise of the company and the fall of the company. So, Beppy, why don't you start us off and let's get right into it. Thank you, Greg. Um, I would like to uh, start this out by saying that I've played I th- most of them, uh, quite a few, maybe 80 something percent. OK. And you've played only a couple. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot to talk about. Um, I, I pretty much I think this was a Game Pass binge for me. Uh, OK. I think they were all on there a couple of years ago. Went through a lot of them. I'm, I'm interested in most of the properties they cover. But I actually had no idea they were a company for as long as they were. Me either. Like 2004. um, Really? Yeah. And an offshoot from LucasArts. Yep, I knew that. Um, I didn't realize that they were involved in kind of perpetuating the Monkey Island and um, Sam and Max, which I don't know anything about. I've never played them. I've heard heard Monkey Island. I haven't heard the other one. Mm -hmm. Um, But they started out doing that. And a seemingly positive reception on those. Mm -hmm. And they were um, apparently just interested in preserving uh, adventure games, Mm -hmm. which I'm on board with um, at the expense of puzzles, which I thought was interesting because I feel like puzzles aren't really as commonplace as they were, Mm -hmm. you know, back then anyway. Um, but I mean, like most other people, you and I were kind of, they, they were put on our radar with the walking dead, uh, Mm -hmm. first game. And so did you know anything about like, did you watch the show or did you like, you know? So, um, no, um, the, as far as I can recall about the walking dead, I never read the comics. Um, I missed the first season of the show. I also can't remember now when the first or second season of the show even came out. It was probably mm-hmm. around 2012. It was yeah. college for me. I think it was like a blitz. Like, let's just like do a, vi- a video game and yeah. you know, show. So I remember watching a little bit of season two and three of the show, but I can't remember if I played this first. Mm-hmm. Either way, I think the game is much better. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> no, I, I only watched up to, I believe, the end of season three. Yeah. And then early yeah, season yeah, yeah, four. Yeah. I feel like that was like the peak of the popularity. Anyway, I mean, I as honestly, when they just wouldn't get out of the prison, someone named like the governor got involved. It just got too silly for me. It, it went on forever. Um, yep. I just I feel like the storytelling in these games in general uh, really brings out um, the great uh, potential mm-hmm. in all these in all these series. Um, Walking Dead was obviously the first um, huge success unbelievable um you couldn't stop hearing about it when it came out do you remember like your first did you play it like episodically yes or, or, okay yeah yeah so the first so um as uh Beppy was saying earlier you've played most of the telltale games mm-hmm. i've played some of them but i did play them on release okay so when the walking dead um episodic you know a season one came out i did buy them episode by episode okay um and i actually um I, I, was this a year ago or maybe could have even been like right around when we started this podcast. I, I actually put together a list of like the 200 something games that I played from 2010 to 2020. Mm-hmm. And for me, the walking dead season one is not only like one of the best, like uh, adventure games I've ever played. I think it's one of the best games I played this decade. Like, period. Yeah, and yeah. That's like that's a if you if you make fun of me on this podcast, that's a tall order for, for sure. Me. No, I, I completely. I mean, I I had heard all these great things about it, and I, I played it. You know, I played all these games complete. Like, I never like I didn't um I didn't get in the middle of and buy episodically. Mm-hmm. It was all like when when it was done. You bought them all all complete. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. or, or, you know, through Game Pass or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, it's just a very compelling self-contained story. I think there's only a handful of characters from the TV show. Yep. Um, really just uh, capturing the maturity and the tragedy and like without doing it in a trite way where... You know certain tropes you've seen over and over again. This was it. It found a way to make it feel 
new. What I thought was cool about the the Walking Dead season one is it, I was it, they're kind of like revitalizing point and click adventure games because mm-hmm. it's not really puzzly. Yeah, there are some quote unquote puzzles, but there are no like. Option, you know, like uh, multiple ways to solve stuff. It's kind of very presented to you yeah. in all the scenarios. And I guess we should say that, you know, all of their games are characterized by this sort of choose your own adventure branching sure. paths. Um, the Walking Dead is unique, and I think it's one of. Um, it's it's pretty much the only one that matters that where there are multiple seasons, so your choices could carry over. And what I thought was very interesting about uh, The Walking Dead season one is um, they did a like a global system where they knew and they it was displayed to you what other players chose. Yeah, that was interesting. What I I don't know if you you found this when we were uh, researching this, but what I was uh, what I was reading was the developers uh, they purposely wanted every choice to be ambiguous. Mm-hmm. They didn't want any choice to be obvious. And what I, I forget who um, who on the development team said this. I, I think I, I'm going to paraphrase this quote. What he said was, if a choice was 75, 25, that was they did not do a good job. Okay. What they were looking for was they wanted almost everything to be split 50, 50 among the fans. Yeah. And at least in this game, I would say they succeeded from, yeah. what, from the stats that I remember. I mean, kind of, I mean, I'm not sure. Again, this is kind of like the Mass Effect data. Not sure how much of it is like trophy hunting or whatever, but sure. Um, I, I I have to say I don't think I would replay any of these games, despite how replayable they theoretically are. Yeah, isn't that are. interesting? I agree. Um, and it's I think for me, like The Walking Dead in particular, is like a little too effective. Where it's like it it gets you into the world in a way that a lot of other post apocalyptic games don't and it's like it's really heartbreaking oh and really yeah like crushing I, I just feel like they did such a good job with a zombie apocalypse being a human story and not a not a horror story yeah. it's not really about the monsters even though it kind of is it's more about the people interacting with each other yeah it's more the setting and, and yeah um, like the human the, conflict. I, that's what i think the show is going for but not is the show still at. going is it done it's, it's on its last season somehow oh my god has it really been 10 fucking years yeah, this is season 11, oh, I believe. Good Lord. So good luck to everybody um, getting through that. I haven't watched it in years, as I mentioned, but I was thoroughly entertained by this this particular season especially. Um, I definitely recommend you play it if you haven't already. I can't believe anyone out there, like, I feel like we don't do this very often where we say on the mic, like, we really do recommend this game. Oh, yeah. Please, Earnestly. Please play The Walking Dead season. Very well one. acted. All, yeah. all super well conceived. And as we'll learn, I mean, we talked a little bit about the the origins of the company here. We are going to get into their downfall later on. Mm -hmm. And something that I'd like to bring up in this period is that this the success of this game is attributed as like this is why we started to fall apart because it was this successful. We were always chasing that high, yeah. trying to basically doing the same thing, not being able to experiment. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's so unfortunate because it's, it's a pitfall that a lot of people have fallen into. I would like to stipulate that the quality did not suffer nearly as much as you would expect because of that. Yeah, exactly. Like the, some of the later ones are, are like excellent and I'm going to talk about them when we get to those, but I just wanted to bring it up that this is kind of, because this was so ubiquitous and so successful, I kind of like set the high watermark. Let me ask you a question before we move on to their other games. Mm -hmm. So the, um, it's pretty obvious, but the, the developers were heavily influenced by heavy rain and Mass Effect. It's kind of like that, you know what I mean? Where they wanted to do the weight of the choice, but through dialogue. Yeah. I feel like those influences make a lot of sense. Do you know, like, why is Telltale Games and The Walking Dead held up in such high regard compared to Heavy Rain, which people make fun of? <laughs> do you th- really think it's the quality of the performance? Because I actually, I really I like so. them both when I played them for the first time, you know? I think that and Walking Dead is a very successful, it was, it was the first season alone was, yeah. it was a huge knockout success. Mm-hmm. And I think people were looking for that and they got it, you mm-hmm. know, like they wanted that kind of, what if I was in their situation? What yeah. choices would I make? Yeah. And that's something where I think 
this series, there's a couple later on that I didn't think were as good a fit yeah. for the Telltale experience. I agree. This is something where you would, where it's kind of like, I'm in a survival, do or die situation, what would I do? And I, I want to make sure I emphasize this. In development, the developers said they wanted every choice to be the wrong choice. Where yeah. it's like there was no clear cut, this is the right thing to do. It's it's all miserable. Yes. And what do you yes, do? Yes, for sure. There's always mm-hmm. consequences. Yeah. And they um, one of the few games where I really they did such a I shouldn't say one of the few games, maybe it was just one of the first games I noticed where the choices you made not only were very impactful, they continue to have ramifications way later. Oh yeah. And you know you remember the cute little thing in The Walking Dead where it's like they will remember that. Right. I quote yeah, that yeah. all the time. That's <laughs> iconic now. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's there's a good amount of like, you kind of, it, and it, not to the game's detriment or anything, but like when he's considering giving the little girl his candy bar and he just puts it in his own pocket. Yeah. To you later. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the funny things you can do. Like, yeah, just I make agree. him a selfish asshole. But um, no, I, I loved it. Um, and unless you have anything else to say, I'd like to move on. Yeah, yeah. Let let's um let's move ahead. I obviously loved it. I yep. think it's one of the best games of the past decade. So let's keep going. In that vein, I think The Wolf Among Us was next. Yeah, I played and this wow. on release too. Probably my favorite overall. I don't know. This, if, you like, know, it. I do think I like the. I like The Walking Dead better just because I. It's grounded in more reality for yeah. me. You're gonna hear me say that a lot on the show, but I also really like The Wolf Among Us. I couldn't believe it because it is so imaginative, but it's a very kind of stupid concept. Yes, and I. I wanted to. I think it's based on. Something that I had never heard of before, uh, called Fables. I didn't. Uh, it's a comic series. I had. I never read them. I didn't. It, is this one of those games? I'm just going to sound uncultured, where I feel like I've heard of the names of all of these characters, but I don't know what they're from. Right. Well, it's 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 all sort of like folklore. And, sure. And, you know, you're you're playing as the big bad wolf. <laughs> yeah. Of 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 Little Red Riding Hood, and and um, you know, there's all these different from completely varying cultures. Mm-hmm. There's like Tiny Tim from, um, fucking Christmas Carol. Yeah. And, and you know. Ichabod Snow White, Crane. yeah, like all, all like the pretty much all these fictitious, like mm-hmm. you know, kind of apocryphal characters, and really interesting because they are kind of um, coexisting in a like subser- subversive society where mm-hmm. they're trying to hide their and they have to uh, wear glamorous to fit in, like because yes. they're really animals or creatures yeah, yeah, yeah. or whatever. It's like they really did like uh, a really fascinating job with like fitting a like a cop drama. It, it's, it takes place in the 1980s. Right. It's like a 1980s cop drama, but you're all fable characters. Yeah. It's bizarre. And it, it that premise, if you're listening to this and you haven't played it, I totally understand if you think this is the dumbest thing in the world because that's what I thought when I heard about <laughs> Me it. Me too. But it's really cool and it something about the tone is just like perfect yeah where if it was a little sillier or a little more serious it could have completely fallen if it was in the wrong hands yes (laughs) exactly and pretty impressive that they were able to translate what is presumably a successful comic into Mm -hmm. a successful game it's a very different uh very different beast um i really actually i wanted to i uh address the soundtrack was really good in this one sure very cool like as soon as you boot it up it's like a really really neat kind of unexpected um like there's some synth stuff going on it's like wow it's really they like really engaging tried to me. juxtapose the fantasy world where it's the but it's but it's the 1980s i yeah. think they kind of were hammering on the same i hate the word vibe but they're hammering on the same vibe there yeah and and more i mean it's it's pretty heavy duty like there's people getting decapitated yeah, and like drug use i kind and, of forgot like how gruesome this story was yes it's like eek. serial killers and yeah. all this stuff and somehow it doesn't it doesn't fall apart and it's, no. it's it's just a miracle and um it's such a shame because they're apparently before they fell apart we're working on a season two and um not that i necessarily needed more but interesting world um i could be wrong here didn't season two get picked up by the next developer who bought the property it could be. I believe it did. I now people can maybe correct me. I thought in 2019 or 2020, um, the uh, Wolf Among Us property was picked up by another by the whoever bought out uh, the properties of Telltale. 
Interesting. I believe um, there's a company that is uh, doing business as Telltale, and they are actually going to be coming out with The Wolf Among Us 2. They kind of absorbed whatever was Yes, left. that was a very recent development in the past year yeah. or so. So that is actually happening. Maybe a good time to bring up that um, I did have that in my notes for later, but uh, people are sort of questioning like the ethics of that and how so many of the original telltale employees have not been paid for their work still and it's oh, kind of really? like the remnants of the company is is you know they get the the success and, and sure. all the you know all the assets and whatnot and pretty rough pretty are rough we situation. getting into the downfall yet because i mean not yet no, i not just yet. wanted just while you brought it up I yeah wanted to, sure i wanted to mention it um and I guess uh, unless you have anything else to say, that's um, that's my thoughts know what? on Wolf um, Among Us. Talking about the Walking Dead and the Wolf Among Us before we move on, do yeah. what I thought was the coolest part of how they do dialogue in these games. What's that? You can say nothing. Yeah, and that's an option. And that in itself is an answer. Yeah, yeah. saying nothing is an answer. And like they'll like if if it's a hostile character, like what you got nothing to say or yeah, something. It's like, like really cool. I've never seen like a. Any of these games, whether it's Heavy Rain or you pick it, I've never seen a game do that where saying nothing is an option. I like that too because it's also timed and it's, yes. it's kind of whereas most with like Mass Effect, you would just kind of be sitting in the menu for however long. Mm -hmm. Like you put your controller down to go to the bathroom or something yeah. and it's like still there. But this one, you have to like pay attention. And mm -hmm. you know what? Thank God you can pause it during yeah. these moments too because if you couldn't, I could very easily see that happen. But no, I understand. Um, yeah, no. I'd recommend that one too wholeheartedly. It's a fascinating mystery plot. Um, some real good payoffs towards the end. And, and much more gruesome and adult than you would think. Like Just like Be uh, Beppy said, like if you think the, the premise of this game sounds completely ridiculous, it actually uh, really comes together in a way that I think you'll find fascinating. Genuinely mature, not, Genu just, not, yeah. not just like shock. Genuinely like very cool. and generally mature. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, so of course they immediately got to work on Walking Dead season two. So why don't we get into that? Why don't you tell me about your experience with that? Kim? Um, okay. So the Walking Dead two, my actually the general notes I wrote down about this is that it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like Clementine kind of grown up. Yeah. Also, I, uh, I'm assuming we're avoiding some spoilers here because yeah, season well, one is so I'll good. I'll just, I'll just say that in season one, you play as an adult and in season two, you play as a child yeah. and like a different character. And it's, the situations that you're put in as a child are Stu really strange. That's, dude, that's so funny. You're kind of reading my notes for me. Yeah. What I said about season two is that the villains are goofy and that the situations you are put in as Clementine are absurd. Yeah. I remember like this one moment. I, I, want, I hope I'm recalling this correctly. There's a bunch of adults in the room, and they're just like, who can climb up this really dangerous thing and do this thing that we are incapable of doing? Right. Clementine. <laughs> She's like 12. <laughs> like, what? It's really, they almost like, do you know what I, I, I almost compare it to? They do like a bad job, almost like having Child Link be really courageous. But like, you mind, that's a fantasy game. Yes. And you're like, in Ocarina of Time, you're 11 or 12, but it's a fucking fantasy game. There are, I do <laughs> like, remember there are like characters who are like, well, we can't ask that of her, we, you know. But, but like, like she some do of it, the but stuff you have to do as a 12 year old is like stupid. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't make any sense. It's it just, um, I guess you can chalk it up to the desperation of, of the characters and the setting, but it in certain places it 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 took me out of it like yeah me too uh, there was like a no. there was actually one cool moment that i really appreciated you know how we just talked about saying nothing is an option yeah remember there's a scene where either someone is like either outside your house or is banging on the door and that's you, like the, you can either answer the door or, or not, not. And yeah. that's one of the first times where i said I'm going to put the controller down and do nothing. Yeah. I don't think I ever selected nothing and as an like option. And like a pretty believable situation for a child to be in. Yeah, do nothing. Yeah, like, you know, someone's at the door, I don't recognize them. Yeah, you I'm going to do, do nothing. Do? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I, it's good. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a very, it's, I would say it's a step down from the first season. Yeah. But I'd, I'd still recommend it if you were, if you enjoyed the first season and wanted and more. And you're invested. Yeah. Um, and yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say like, there's a pretty, uh, impactful moment at the end, which seems to be a branching path. Um, 
it's part of the snowstorm. Yes. Do you remember that? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Very, I, it, it did kind of get under my skin where it's like, I'm still living in the world. There's still kind of these heavy duty consequences for mm-hmm. stuff. Uh, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Anyway. No, I was just going to say the ending of the game. I agree with you, but it also bothered me. I don't want to spoil it, but yeah. it just feels like you were given a very obvious choice, and it felt like to me the wrong answer gives a better a better outcome. Sure, and it's well, I don't want to spoil it, but it's like you have you're in like a life or death situation, and it's just when I saw both outcomes, that's when I feel like this franchise started to teeter a little bit for yeah. me in terms of like the choices and consequences. It's not really, I think, working as intended. Yeah, well, I, I guess. It's kind of that unpredictable, like we don't want... It's a little far... A, a I guess right what I'm saying is the ending anything. of two is a little far-fetched for me. Yeah, it's it's just like a little too complicated. Yeah. Um, I can I can see where they were coming from, though. Um, did you play Tales from the Borderlands? No, I, <laughs> I've said this a couple of times on the podcast. I don't like Borderlands. I don't either. So naturally, I didn't play this. Did you? So you didn't play this at all. I didn't play this at all. Uh, I've heard it's it's pretty well liked by fans. So good for them. Yeah. Um. Just didn't uh, didn't pick it up because it wasn't for me. Well, I I do think is this the point where um in their history where it, the Walking Dead has got to be bearing on them right where they really couldn't do anything else besides make that. Um. Well, it's it's certainly like. You know, they immediately went back into make after Wolf Among Us Sorry, made season two. I, what I know, mean so. is, like, every one of their games had to be had to be like The Walking Dead, like it. Yeah, that's what yeah, I mean. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, no, and um, I don't know much about the world of Borderlands because mm-hmm. I played a little bit of the first game the first when, it, when it came out. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it suits the Telltale. That's gonna be that's gonna come up a couple of times whether mm-hmm. or not it's a good fit. Mm-hmm. Um, the next one is though, which is the Game of Thrones. Uh, Did you series. play that? Yes. Was it good? It's insanely good. Really? It, it was like because this was at a point where I fell out of love with the show around like <laughs> season three, as like, we all should. Like end of season three, that's kind of where my last straw was drawn, mm-hmm. and it wasn't like I, you know, I not to be a purist, but like it's it kind of just leaned more into the sensationalized aspects. That's what I was talking about before with Wolf Among Us is like the genuine maturity. Mm -hmm. And like there was a lot of like shock value, like we're on HBO kind of thing. Sex and blood, we're on HBO. Exactly. Yeah. And then this game really got it when it comes to the difficult decisions. Interesting. And like the kind of um if you're in a position like like the lord of this estate or whatever, what are you going to do to keep the people happy? Mm-hmm. What are you going to do to you know, are you going to jeopardize this alliance? Are you going to honor your family who was killed by so and so? It was really like you know, cuz it's all kind of made up for the the game like this that's surprising you know, to me that just like uh, Game of Thrones, the much maligned television show, especially <laughs> at the end, yeah. and Hulse Beeson, he's never going to finish those books either. Right. And it's, it's so Telltale knocks it out of the park again. Oh, yeah. Me. Like, like and in, in the same way that the, they did with The Walking Dead is that yeah. you have these insanely talented writers who absolutely knew what they were doing. Mm-hmm. It is very much because there's like a super like they they get you to know like uh co- two different characters over the course of the game you follow their stories and then they make you choose near the end which one is going to survive and it's yeah. like fuck, fuck i don't know and it's time too so it's like fuck fuck fuck, fuck. Yeah. yeah really cool really cool game definitely recommend playing it um maybe i will i i kind of forgot they did that yeah you, you should play that for sure it's a much better representative of the books than the show was <laughs> <laughs> um that was great <laughs> This is where this is where we get into some choppy, uh, choppy, choppy, choppy waters. seas. Yeah, okay. um, Minecraft story mode. Did you hear anything about so this? All I know about this is this is the point in their careers where there was a lot of pressure on them to keep making the same kind of game over and over again, very fast. And very and um, well, obviously, doing uh, Minecraft story mode would have been a huge money maker. For, mm-hmm. I believe it was one of the only games they made that was a huge money maker for them. Yes. As far as I was reading, they only made money on the early Walking Dead and and uh, Minecraft. Right. They made nothing off the other stuff, right. which I found fascinating. Uh, a lot of flops for sure. But this is so funny because um, 
I will talk a little bit more about this later, but this is where kind of their market research, their disastrous market research was coming into play. Mm -hmm. There's a, I couldn't find it when I was looking up for this, um, this show, but uh, at the time, two years ago, when Telltale went under, there was like an hour long video on YouTube of um, this employee who worked there and she goes into great detail and what their sort of final hours were like. And something she said about Minecraft story mode was that um, the intended audience for this was uh, mid 20s, uh, early 30s. That should be raising some eyebrows. Exactly. And so that's why in, I believe, the first trailer, there were like dick jokes and just kind of inappropriate, mature. And it's like, these are like, this is for little kids. You know that, right? You know, until you just said that, I didn't really put together that Telltale, the mature storytelling company, is making a Minecraft story mode game, but Minecraft is played by kids. Yes. And um, okay, so they did two seasons of that. Yeah, I'll just get that out of the way. And don't do you remember they did something with Netflix with this? Yes, where it was like playable on Netflix. Yes, or something? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that's kind of interesting. I mean if it was, I don't know anything about Minecraft. I just know that kids play it, and then you probably shouldn't include in like offensive jokes. Well, I in mean, it. <laughs> from what I remember from Telltale's timeline, wasn't there bankruptcy and, and restructuring right around this time? Of Minecraft and the Netflix involvement weren't those. I think like, this is this is about the halfway point. It's right there, isn't it? Yeah, this is where the kind of the top of the roller coaster, if you yeah, will. Yeah, sure. Um, so didn't play this. Don't know anything about it. Um, they did a brief Walking Dead uh, for the Michonne character. Yeah, they did a standalone. I mean, it was fine. I okay. played it. It's only a couple episodes, I very didn't. short. I mean, because I didn't really. She only just showed up when I stopped watching the show. And I, I guess I was always curious about what her backstory was. Mm-hmm. It's fine. Inessential, in inoffensive. Okay. Um, uh, the Batman game was sure. next. Okay. And let me tell you, this game rocks. Okay. I'm going to like, you're, you're going to, this is of maybe in an unpopular opinion. Okay. But I, I thought they did two of these. The first one is what I'm going to talk about right now. Very, very impressive. Really? Um, and funny because I would not necessarily pick this as a good telltale, uh, series. Okay. Um, in terms of, you know, Batman is kind of like, what decisions does he really have to make? Like his mm-hmm. life is pretty clear cut, but something about it that it's awesome is that it finds ways to make the characters feel new. Okay. Um, a very, very different take different from the movies, the TV shows, the Arkham games, totally different. So take even on though the they're like, they're completely different games, would you put these up there with the Arkham games? Or just, um, they're just very in, way too different. narratively, yeah, really, yeah. Okay. Like, wow. like in terms of, say, uh, for instance, like the penguin is a character, and the you know he it's very kind of um, grounded mm-hmm. this version, and he's he's uh, he gets the um, he gets beat up at one point in the game, sure, and he just has like black eyes, so he looks like a penguin. <laughs> it's like that's fucking cool, right? And they they kind of entangle like the two face and Catwoman relationships in different and interesting ways. Really took me by surprise because I didn't hear a lot mm-hmm. of positive press about it. I think it performed very poorly, wow, uh, commercially. Um, but I would definitely recommend that one. Okay, um, Walking Dead Season 3, did you play this? Um, I only played a little bit of it. Okay, so I'm going to get into uh, some gripes here. Okay. So it's tough because as we talked about in the Mass Effect uh, episode, the more branching decisions you have in a series, the more difficult it is to fulfill them. Yeah, because it becomes an exponential problem. Exactly. Branches turn into more branches. And holy shit it really it, it kind of they took this the easiest way out here mm-hmm. um because all you have i think five different endings for season two but like yep. five super different outcomes and in the beginning of season three pretty much the entire season you are playing as an unrelated guy okay and his family um just dealing with their drama it's like fine it's, it's just kind of it feels sort of like how many di- like you know, can we do a Walking Dead forever? You yeah, know, like can sure. we do do a new character sure, here sure. in like different situations? Felt like testing the waters. 
And it's pretty cool to see Clementine as like an outside sure. character who's not like a protagonist. It's just kind of someone you run into at a certain point. But the beginning of this season, once you once you meet up with her, you realize that all of the different endings from the previous one have pretty much led to the same outcome. Okay, so it didn't really matter. It didn't really matter. Um, people are dead one way or another or disappeared or whatever mm-hmm. and ju- just not relevant anymore. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, it's just kind of a disappointment and I think it didn't do well critically either and it's just sort of like if, if season two was a step down from season one, this was like even further. Okay. You know what I mean? Uh, it's, you can skip it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, it's like... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I it it's okay, you mm-hmm. know. Um, it's it's meh. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy was the next one. I didn't play this. Didn't play that. I did. Well, um, you played all these, huh? Most of them. Mm-hmm. This one is okay, but it. Um, this is something else that that former employee talked about is that um, their market research uh, told them that the the allure of Guardians of the Galaxy was that it was um, mature and serious, which holy shit like i'm not like the biggest fan of the movies but i was interested in what they were gonna do with it another kind of odd fit situation Mm -hmm. where how many how much decision making is there really like they're they're just kind of there to go on adventures and i remember um reading about uh guardians of the galaxy the telltale game obviously yeah what i remember reading is they all of their humor and sort of smart, smart, you know, sort of um, whip smart humor was like taken out after Reese or after like R and D or like testing, and it, they, I guess, higher Only ups gradually added back in yeah. when they realized no one. Cared. Or I guess like <laughs> higher ups wanted it completely rewritten. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a lot of that as they went on because these games were kind of um, coming out super fast. People were working mm-hmm. insanely long hours apparently. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of stuff was being rewritten at the last minute, which sounds like a nightmare. Mm-hmm. Um, totally. Considering how much effort presumably goes into I this. was reading like at some point they were like a few days away from certification and were rewriting and right. recording lines. Yeah. 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 yeah, totally. It's just a, not like necessarily a bad game or narrative, just kind of odd because yeah. it's, it's very, very tonally different from, the movies and presumably the comic books too. Um, so this is another like, okay one. Um, I already talked about Minecraft story mode season two. Yep. Um, the second Batman season was even better than the first one. That Wow. And people didn't really like it. People didn't talk about either no. of them at all. And it didn't make them any money. No. And, and this is fascinating because it's a story that I've never seen before. And it's, it's Bruce Wayne palling around with the villains. Oh, wow. And you're okay. just kind of like hanging out with the Joker and Mr. Freeze. And the Joker isn't really fully formed yet as a character. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting about it is that you can either um, like he really looks up to Batman. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> so you can either um, kind of treat him nicely, in which case he takes it way too far and becomes obsessive and tries to be a Batman himself. <laughs> okay. Or or you can rebuff him and like treat him like shit. And then he just becomes like the Joker as you know him. And it's, 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 it's a pretty interesting take successful application of the telltale, uh, motto of not having a right choice. Yeah. And that was really cool and had a great ending, uh, very meaningful. And it's, it's a shame that those games didn't do better because it was a really interesting take. And so, here we are at the end of their main kind of career um, mm-hmm. in terms of the Walking Dead type games. And how fitting is it that it's the final season of The Walking Dead? Sure. And you did you never, ever get around to playing this um, one? I did play some of it. I, also, I, I read all the summaries and I watched the videos because I couldn't play it. I also, yeah. like, at that point, I was very in tune with what was going on yeah. with the company. And, it's, and we should note that um, only two of the four episodes were done by Telltale themselves and they had yes. to stop like mid production. Yeah, and that's when they went under, right? Very suddenly. Yes. And uh Robert Kirkman, the creator of Walking Dead, his company took over. And I must say they did an excellent job yeah. um recreating kind of the Telltale magic he, there. He um he actually had a really good quote too where he said he made it a personal mission to make sure the original development team was back to do the last two episodes because yep. he wanted it to be as authentic in their vision as possible. Yeah. And honestly, I 
for whatever I think it was partially that like all the extenuating circumstances really kind of made this experience a lot more emotional for me mm-hmm. even though I wasn't following like I didn't play the first season in 2011 or whatever mm-hmm. it was a couple of years later but it made the ending so much knowing that it this is the this is the end the final season mm-hmm. it's all come to this and even though they are kind of retreading some of the themes of the first season yeah, they are it is i thought it was very emotionally effective because there is no like happy ending yeah it's a very it's very rough emotionally and i i was very almost choked up by the yeah. end of the story kind of like the real life uh, you know connections with the game and what was going on with yeah. them and yeah and i, I was so relieved that it was very small scale like it yeah. wasn't like this huge overdone ending it was a lot shorter than the other seasons uh, just just a great job and a very kind of bittersweet ending for the telltale experience yeah. as a whole mm-hmm. um i just i i'd like to take a moment to sort of celebrate how they briefly did kind of achieve their goal of extending i you saw a lot more indie developers getting into adventure games and yeah. story driven, interactive storytelling, driven. graphic adventure games. After that, after Walking Dead, especially, mm-hmm. and you know, pretty incredible that they were able to sort of breathe new life into it. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was even a, I don't want to call it a ripoff company. Uh, what there was a company that essentially made the same kind of game. They did a King's Quest game, which it right. wasn't Telltale, but a different company copied that style. Yeah. Yeah, so they definitely had their influence, and I, you know, listening to you talk about those those other franchises that I didn't play, mm-hmm. I, this has got to be one of the few developers that they've nailed the story and the narrative over and over and over. And yeah. I've never heard of them, or, or I mean, never heard of the the individuals involved. Yeah, and considering how much pressure they were under, the fact that those last couple, like, there's some not game breaking bugs, but you'll see like a lot more spelling errors, yeah, or, or like sure. you know, someone will forget to talk or something, mm-hmm. just because. Because that they were under such tremendous, like you know, pressure to get these games out, mm-hmm. it's, it's insane how they that they turned out as well as they did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I would like to kind of go into a post mortem a little bit, yeah, sure. and just kind of discuss why things went down the way they did. Yeah. Okay. Um, so as we mentioned before, kind of the Walking Dead being incredibly successful, they weren't really able to iterate or experiment. Um, because they had a lot of problems growing mm-hmm. where they weren't really sure, you know, how to budget their employees or their time. Um, it came, it kind of became like, you need to have these instant returns, like for every quarter you need to show whatever. And they started hiring like the guy, uh, John Richitello. I'm okay. sure you've heard uh, stories <laughs> okay. about this guy, the EA fella. Um, one of their founders is actually c- pretty consistently blamed by employees. Um, yeah, what was his name? Kevin Bruner. Yes. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. Pretty much, pretty universally um, reviled. At reviled. The, at the but end. Yeah, just because his seemingly his decisions and his the way he treated employees was pretty objectionable. From what I interpreted, he at the start he was. I mean, I, I'm. This is all hearsay. From what I've interpreted, at the start, he was kind of this visionary guy who wanted he wanted the team to make what they wanted to make. Mm-hmm. But then he got obsessed with the success of The Walking Dead, and yeah. the team could not do anything other than make games like that. Yeah. And then the sort of the Telltale uh, game engine or the Telltale sort of um, template started wearing people out. It was hard to get these games out. You know, yep. in at at the the episodic timeline, it's almost like they're awesome. Um, original vision became incredibly hard to handle. It's hard too when they were pretty much for financial reasons working with existing IPs yeah. which mm-hmm. have their own limitations, you know, people have even if they are allowed to tell their own story, there can only be so much like so much they, they can do there's with the a property. Br- there's a brand that needs yeah. to be maintained, mm-hmm. which evidently, you know, <laughs> they didn't really care too much about with Minecraft and Guardians of the Galaxy, but sure. interesting. Um yeah, crunch up to 60 hours a week. Yep. Absolutely brutal. Um, a lot of leadership shakeups. The guy from Zanga showed up at yeah. one point. Mm-hmm. He tried to write the ship with that Netflix deal, but unfortunately it seems like the damage was done at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, just couldn't couldn't hack it. Um, yeah, I mentioned that that uh, that experience that, that that employee had. Sure. Um, she was talking about how 
you had like some unpaid person working into the night to prep like um like sort of their goodbye packages like nobody got severance so i don't even know what these were yeah yeah i think they had like benefits for a short amount of time afterwards and it was very well documented how like you know they got no severance health insurance was brief after they were terminated yes and they i i was reading a story too where they only had like what 30 minutes or something to leave the office yeah, with just all clean their out your desk and that's it bizarre it's so it's incredible how it was clearly like the problem was way worse than anybody knew yeah the fact that they had to leave like that quickly like we're now. shutting down we're turning the lights off today it's insane um lcg entertainment by the way is the one that um uh, bought out the remnants or whatever oh, okay they're and, doing um, business as telltale that's what we were yes. talking about earlier and so I think uh, you said the Wolf Among Us, mm-hmm. and it's the Wolf Among Us two, as far as I'm aware. Yes, and I'm not sure what else they're planning on resurrecting, or if they plan mm-hmm. to hire back any of the employees. But as far as I know, um, anyone who owes those people money has not made any attempt to yeah give them any sort of recompense, and it's just insane because. I mean, it's it's pretty funny because we were recently called an apolitical uh, podcast, <laughs> podcast. <laughs> and not to get political, but there's certain things that I like to have on mic that, you know, that we stand for because I feel like that's a good way to live. And it's like talking about like we had the DLC episode recently, mm-hmm. tried to be sort of understanding about the costs of making games and everything like that, about how there's two sides to an issue. But ultimately, nobody wants to pay more for anything. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, if you can just, like, get your money's worth, like, people are happy. Yeah. And that's just a basic kind of tenet of consumer culture. And it's, like, I want to be on the record of how we stand with these employees. Yeah, And how, like, we feel really bad for them. And how, you know, they deserve better benefits and, you know, not to be treated like that. There was, it was a long kind of death. Like they were, they were bleeding employees the whole time. Yeah. And we should say that too. Like for as much on goddamn GameCube as we make fun of stuff, we have fun with stuff. We yeah. call things bad or I, I never use the word lazy. I want to make sure people know that like we, what I've said very frequently is games are very hard to make. Yep. And it takes a lot of people, a lot of money, and a lot of time. Um, and absolutely, like with this Telltale saga, that absolutely kind of like put the spark under um, the discussion of um, game devs. Maybe they should unionize. Yeah, yeah, for um, sure. For sure. Because, I mean, I'm so glad. Like We, we talked to Mike Bithel about this a little bit. Yeah. Where um, the idea of crunch and how consumers can help. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad that like like d- health of developers is kind of coming to the forefront of gaming communities. Oh yeah, rather like when you hear stuff like whether it's the people at Rockstar, or the anywhere or Blizzard or wherever, it's like I I don't understand how employees can be treated this this poorly, but it yeah. still happens. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I I mean there's there's not much more to say, but I would like to say if by by some chance you're a former Telltale employee and you hear this podcast episode and you're not horribly insulted by it <laughs> for any reason, um, you're more than welcome to share your story here. We'd love mm-hmm. to talk to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, Beppy, do you have any final thoughts? You think we should wrap it here? Any other? No, final I just, I, you know, even though there's not a whole lot of gameplay beyond making the decisions and pointing mm-hmm. and clicking, I think these games are very well done, very polished, as I mentioned. And there's a couple of kind of uh, underrated yeah. uh, ones in there that I hope people give a shot to. And um, I hope uh, whatever happens next with that stuff, uh, the employees are treated better. Yeah, um, I agree. I, I just want to reiterate from what I said earlier. I do think The Walking Dead Season 1 is one of the best games I played this decade. Mm-hmm. I also really like The Wolf Among Us. And I do want to say... I think you know, whatever happens with Telltale Properties after this, they had a ton of industry influence forever. Right. Whether you call them point and clicks, uh, interactive movie games, graphic adventure games, whatever your word for these are, Telltale really did it at the highest level. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really all I have to say about it. And I think we are going to um, end this for now, and we will see you guys next time on Goddamn GameCube. Thank you.